Sì, vediamo sì. i tuoi student doc presentation form. No, davvero? Sì, adesso non più. Ah, ok. Adesso okay. vediamo la, la slide. Ok, perfetto. Ok, so we are going to start. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, our first uh, talk. Uh, I would just uh, want, like to remind you the frame of this uh, lecture series that is uh, on the one side, the um, cost action um, European middle class mass housing. This uh, series of four talks uh, is organized as a webinar uh, in the framework uh, of uh, the research network of the research project, but also in the framework of uh, a PhD course uh, titled uh, uh, Devoted to Historical Studies on Housing that this year proposed this seminar titled Writing the History of Post-War Housing Complexes and the neighborhoods, a take on research strategies and methodologies. So we asked to all our guests, our scholars, who in the last years published seminar works in the historical studies on housing, uh, to present their past and current researches focusing on research strategies, uh, approaches, uh, tools and uh, practices. So today, We have uh, our uh, third guest, who is uh, Yael Alwey. Uh, uh, Yael is an uh, uh, assistant professor at uh, the Technion Institute of Technology, but is also the um, responsible, the chair, the head of the housing lab titled History and the Future of Living. Her uh, uh, talk today uh, will be titled Housing as a Research Question and as a Field in the Architectural History of uh, Israel Palestine, uh, the Pivotal Case uh, Methods. Uh, I think, yeah, that while I introduce yourself, I would unshare the screen so you can prepare your. Uh, okay. Can so the audio work? Okay, perfect. Um, so many of us already know uh, Yael uh, work. Uh, she is uh, also an architect uh, um, and, and an, uh, a scholar. Uh, and uh, beyond uh, heading and directing the housing lab, um, She uh, is also an activist. Uh, she, she's involved in both in academic research and activism in the Israeli housing social movement. I would like just to remind her book. You can see here uh, the um, the cover. Uh, her book that was published by Rutledge in 2017, uh, titled uh, "Zionist as Housing Regime," that look at the period between 1860 and 2000. 11. Uh, her research uh, uh, on the history uh, of uh, Israel-Palestine conflict uh, through observed uh, through housing was published on several journals uh, like Urban Studies, Footprint, uh, Architecture Beyond Europe uh, and other uh, magazines. Uh, I would like just to conclude this uh, presentation thanking Yael uh, uh, because she accepted our invitation and reminding that in the past uh, year Uh, she was uh, uh, chairing uh, along with uh, Susan Schindler and with uh, myself a research group at the Israel Institute uh, um, uh, of Advanced Studies in Jerusalem uh, titled Retheorizing the Housing, Housing as Architecture. Uh, so I would not, uh, I will leave, uh, give the floor uh, to, um, to Yael and uh, I'm tired, sorry. Uh, uh, so we can start uh, with the, the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Gaia. Um, I would like first to thank uh, Gaia and Filippo for, for this opportunity of a dedicated discussion to the methodological challenges um, of conducting research on mass housing. This is quite an opportunity because we often uh, discuss the findings and uh, I find this um, uh, lecture series uh, quite fascinating and provocative. So um, today I would like to, to, to discuss um, a history of Israel-Palestine as a housing enterprise, um, what I define homeland, uh, in a long ongoing history of the gain and loss of individual and national homes. 
And what I will be doing, first I will introduce kind of briefly the case. I will discuss the methodological questions um, that I uh, posed in order and, and, um, and methods that I uh, imagined in order to uh, un undertake this research um, and uh, introduce some findings and the, um, the way that these methods enabled me to uh, produce a, a long arch of historical inquiry of mass housing and then um, identify some new research questions and new research methods um, um, and try to kind of uh, uh, take you into some of the of the research, uh, ongoing research in my group. So um, let me open with this scene from the 2011 mass housing protest in Israel um, to a movement that drew millions of Israelis to the streets to, in demand of housing. Um, this image taken in Tel Aviv captures, uh, as you can see, a young man sitting on a light pole holding a hand-drawn Israeli flag whose centerpiece, the National uh, Religious Star of David, is replaced with a house. Um, the flag declares housing as the centerpiece of membership in Israeli society and of Israeli citizenship, rather than religion, ethnicity or nationality. Uh, moreover, considering the full urban and political context of this setting um, and, and the housing protest um, at large, we can see on the left government office towers, on the right the iconic communication tower of the Israeli Defense Forces headquarters at the center of the city, and the light, uh, the light stand itself, which is very recognizable of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art um, Square where the demonstration was taking place. So, namely, this flag proclaims housing to be stronger claim for rights, citizenship, and identity, and a stronger raison d'etre than military power, Hebrew culture, or mere sovereignty. So, um, I'm using this kind of reading through this image in order to claim that housing um, is the cultural object forming Israeli society around it, and Zionism's key strategy for nation building and sovereignty. This strategy, housing, enabled the gradual accumulation of future citizens since the 1860s, um, in the name of whom the, the state of Israel would eventually be founded. Upon statehood, um, starting 1948, um, this strategy establishes the, nas the nation state by nationalizing um, immigrants um, and including them in the nation state via concrete housing in the national home. And since 1967, housing, whether, whatever your opinion about it is, um, housing serves as expanding the nation state by housing citizens beyond uh, its borders. At the same time, housing has historically allowed citizens to negotiate their status and membership in the national home by struggles over individual homes. So you can see here Palestinian Israel's struggle against housing demolitions, Mizrahi uh, Jewish um, struggle for access to um, uh, public housing and the um, uh, 2011 um, housing protests. Um, so um, in this sense, I offer a kind of a complementing historiography or an alternative thesis for Zionist sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the well-known um, thesis that include uh, ex extending from the gain of strategic military power um, service of Western or colonial or imperial um, powers to a space for Hebrew culture. So, um, as I said, my focus today focuses on the methods that I use to undertake this study, uh, facing what I see as the two strategic challenges uh, that mass housing pose um, to traditional methods of historical inquiry. So, one of them is the historical scope that mass housing, uh, modern mass housing, um, demand our attention to. And the second is the vast nature of the phenomenon of mass housing. As you saw in uh, the first talk by Miles Glendining two weeks ago, the study of mass housing requires developing methods that address these challenges and that extend the methods that are used for the study of unique or specific architectural icons. Um, so in defining the historical scope for, the, for this case, um, when we look at the, at the early history of Zionism, we can see that the violent national conflict in Palestine 
erupted some 20 years uh, after the formation of Zionism's two iconic built landscape, the kibbutz and the, the, the Hebrew city. So we have a historiographical gap of some 20 years that points to a problem of cause and effect in the, historiogra in the historiography of Israel-Palestine and offers housing as a key object of inquiry, suggesting that housing history um, requires broadening our historical uh, scope. Um, the, the importance of housing as a cultural product also requires historization and theorization. So why does housing history um, um, kind of in a sense occur earlier than other elements of the historical narrative? So um, when we look at the scope of the housing uh, cultural object in the Israeli Palestinian case, uh, defining it um, kind of requires expanding inquiry beyond permanent structures um, and to, in order to include such dwellings as tents and shacks. So the tent, which was uh, the most important cultural artifact of the 2011 protest movement, was used by protesters of all walks of Israeli society to invoke their dwelling histories of the struggle for home and homeland, often, often uh, in conflict with one another. So um, these precarious dwellings that, of course, do not remain in the built environment, rarely remain in the archives, um, portray the, the fault lines of Israeli society and also the uncanny shared architecture of claims to home and homeland for these conflicting publics. So um, these are these kind of, of dwelling architecture, dwelling history is necessarily part of our story. So uh, just briefly to um, flesh this out. So um, on your left, uh, we see um, um, socialist Zionist pioneer settlements of the early 1920s, uh, where some of the key social principles uh, were framed in this collection called Our Community, whose cover was the tent. So the tent was a symbol of early uh, socialist Zionism. In the middle, we see Palestinian Nakba, whose tent camp housing by the United Nations, uh, while it was long ago, ago replaced with permanent structure in um, the refugee camps, in uh, densifying urban fabrics, maintains the demand for return by, by invoking the cultural image of the tent as marker of uh, identity and political rights in graffitis all over the, the camps. And on your right, um, we see post-independence immigrant camps housing uh, primarily Jews from Muslim uh, countries, in, in what is clearly substandard housing that to this day is associated with their precarious uh, social position and marginalization in society. So um, we need to expand the, the historical scope and expand, expand our, uh, the, our purview of the object of study. So how do we, um, how do we identify what is important in the vast area of dwelling phenomena, some of them um, easily escaping um, uh, escaping us since they are not well archived. And uh, how do we define uh, the beginning and the end of the historical scope, right? Um, how do we identify sites for close historical inquiry within this vast um, um, scope of uh, housing phenomena? So um, addressing these challenges, I started by posing some theoretical and conceptual questions. Uh, one of them was, of course, uh, why housing? Um, why was housing so important to produce the homeland enterprise and uh, um, to, uh, as I showed you, to uh, have occurred some 20 years before uh, the conflict over this, over this homeland? Um, for me, this question identifies um, the historical period by which planned dwellings for citizens served as an important cultural, political, and economic instrument in this homeland enterprise. Um, another very important question is, of course, what is housing? Uh, this question defines our object of inquiry, so um, which cases to study and what is the object? And so to paraphrase uh, John Turner's famous etymology for housing, asking whether housing is a verb or a noun, a process or a product, um, I frame housing as being simultaneously an act a house, a policy, a value, a typology, a settlement form, a space, a cultural product, and of course, uh, real estate. 
Um, and so, as you as you can see, I highlighted uh, in red the aspects of housing that are within the traditional scope of architecture. Since, as you very well know, housing is uh, uh, discussed in the last two decades primarily as a matter of planning and policy, and transitioning with nation with neoliberalism to a matter of real estate uh, development. While the architectural aspects of housing are largely missing from contemporary uh, discourse either as political product or as real estate product. So um, um, this question, uh, the architectural question, what is housing, which we have been debating in, a, in the research group that Gaia mentioned earlier, involves such question as what is a housing unit? How do we dwell? Uh, how does the dwelling unit function? What are the cardinal elements, et cetera, et cetera. So as an architectural um, historian, I make two, um, three actually, non-traditional uh, methodological proposals. Um, one of them is uh, propose a long history. So rather than narrow down on a specific case or a specific period, I propose a long history. Uh, in my case, it's 1860 to 2011, that allows for examining um, long-term processes in housing. Um, Second, I, institute in an, I insist on an architectural study of housing, uh, namely reading it as a typology, a settlement type, a cultural product, and spatiality. So just, just to uh, uh, stress that this approach does not argue against any policy or economic or any social aspect of housing, but rather for an architectural study of housing as a designed instrument. So, for example, this allows me to read the tent typology together with a single family home and produce a certain reading um, of a speciality um, that economic or policy studies cannot make. And in order to perform these two, uh, the first and the second uh, um, um, proposals, I propose what I call uh, the study of pivotal cases. So, a pivotal case rather than a, um, what we call a case study um, um, differs. So while a case study represents many other cases and is in a sense portrays a stable historical period, I propose uh, the, the study of cases that um, presented a, or um, instigated pivotal change in the architecture and modes of housing and marks changes in the historical process. Um, so here in this timeline, you see three, um, three of the pivotal cases that I've been looking at in, um, in this research. Um, in a sense, it's kind of an illustration to this, but most importantly, um, these methods help me to identify the beginning or the, or the big bang of uh, housing um, in Israel-Palestine. Um, the, the, the beginning of the histor my historical period of inquiry. So this uh, Big Bang, which enabled uh, housing as a strategy, um, was the Ottoman 1858 uh, Land Commodification Code, which was a land modernization reform, which changed the terms of land ownership in the entire Ottoman um, Empire from um, the, the terms of ownership by cultivation to ownership by monetary purchase and uh, formal registration. This reform privatized the Sultan's imperial lands uh, and enabled purchase of large tracts of land by a new class of landowners who developed large plantations for agricultural production, employing a new class of landless serfs as labor. Historical maps, uh, for example, for the area of Jaffa, show us the extent of this big bang. We have here an 1848 1842, sorry, map of Jaffa, of Jaffa is a walled city with nothing uh, around it. And an 1880 uh, map of the agricultural landscape of four profit plantations, pr primarily Sirtis, Jaffa oranges, that formed um, in merely 40 years. So um, historiography of, of these landscapes does not include the term plantation. Uh, and we don't even have an Arabic or an Hebrew name for plantation that embeds uh, the, the, um, the land and labor exploitation aspects of this, of this landscape. Um, and this is only referring to the agriculture. 
But uh, when we look at the architecture of these landscapes, we can start seeing what, the, what was happening. Um, the reform changed the traditional architecture of housing in Palestine, which was based on single room stone dwellings, these ones, for example, uh, grouped together around courtyards to form defensive structures, uh, as can be seen uh, in these images and plans from the Jerusalem uh, here, hill area, from this is Silwan. Um, the reform plantations broke this typology down to parts, forming two new housing typologies. The first one was a single room mud hut, which was built by the landless serfs who were cultivating their plantations. The use of mud bricks made the courtyard uh, iteration unsustainable due to erosion, and the courtyard type was replaced with a cluster of single standing structures forming the surf village. Uh, the second type was the multi-room house serving the landowner, built with the funds generated by, by for-profit uh, cultivation, forming the elaborate big house of the plantation. So the, uh, the cluster of rooms have uh, become uh, a, a single house for the, for the landowner and uh, single, single standing um, one room huts. So uh, my pivotal case here is the town of Mazra in the Western Galilee, which is literally farm, Mazra is literally, literally farm, whose lands pretty much covered the entire Western uh, Galilee. Uh, historical maps show the size of the plantation and the geographical location of the two architectural types. You can see um, the surf village um, at, at here and here in this area. Um, and uh, um, and distant from um, from the landowners uh, from the landowners uh, mansion at the top of the of the map. So um, the architectural and geographical separation between classes marks a divide in Palestinian society that was far earlier than that forming uh, between Israelis between Palestinians and Zionists and which has eroded local society in terms of social links and created two different interests regarding the land. Landowners' interest in controlling land for profit agriculture versus um, surf interest in regaining connection to the land that they were cultivating, um, and which was the uh, very well uh, materialized in the architecture of those new um, housing types. The reform enabled monetary purchase of land um, and thus the entry of non-Muslims uh, to the area and the formation of Jewish plantations as well. Uh, land was purchased by Zionist organizations like the Jewish National Fund and labor was provided by landless Zionist workers. Um, at the Kinneret plantation, Jewish workers rebelled against um, the, the monger arguing for an alliance between the Jewish agency landowner and landless workers as partners uh, in forming the future national home. Workers argued that mere ownership cannot sustain without their labor and dwelling on the land and demanded self-sovereignty over the, their part of the national land. And this alliance took shape in the communal settlement form, the kibbutz, uh, as uh, the building block for the future nation uh, per the um, socialist uh, values. Um, the architectural and settlement shape of the commune was the main site of contestation and negotiation between the landowners and the commune of workers. Uh, Kibbutz Bet Alpha commune rejected the design proposed by its, uh, um, proposed uh, for them by the J uh, JNF architect Richard Kaufman as a system of uh, enclosed courtyards, you can see here, um, which were def defensive colonial layout, um, they hired their own architect, their own um, uh, a friend, their friend from uh, Vienna, um, um, Leopold Kakower, and eventually negotiated the kibbutz settlement model that we now know, which is uh, the quite iconic, of single standing houses spread on the landscape, as you can see here, uh, namely as a surf village. Sorry. Um, another important pivotal case is the um, Hebrew city of Tel Aviv, which was founded in 1919, um, not on industry or commerce, 
uh, as most modern cities, but on houses and on the idea of the city as a housing estate. The 1925 master plan for expanding it uh, beyond, to a city of 100,000 people um, was prepared by Sir Patrick Geddes uh, as a city for urban workers based on the worker house as the cell unit of the urban block, what Geddes termed the home block. Um, this home block was composed of two rings of worker housing uh, surrounded surrounding a semi-autonomous uh, collectively managed urban park. Um, so here you can see the layout as adopted by the city's planning department and the houses and yards cultivated by urban workers. Geddes's plan enabled workers to purchase small plots at the edges of the planned area, around here for example, uh, based on future earnings um, and, and self-build small structures um, where the city has not reached yet in uh, what I call housing before street urban development, um, which in a sense still characterizes Israeli urbanism. In other words, uh, workers did not wait for the city or for developers to build for them, but used the plan to produce semi-autonomous home blocks in an archipelago of self-managed worker communities um, which corresponded well with Geddes's anarchist design principles and urban theory. Um, um, okay, so after these neighborhoods at the edges of the plan were built, the city extended uh, urban services like urban uh, sewage and roads to reach them, forming the layout of the Geddes plan in a very, in a relatively short time, making Tel Aviv's uh, Geddes's only realized um, uh, urban master plan. So with stated in 1948, Israel faced the task of housing millions of immigrants, um, initially housing them in former uh, barracks of the British Army. Um, Israel saw three different housing schemes in its first years, in an, an unprecedented number of plans which reflects the significance of housing to establishing the state, as well as the meaning of proper housing for citizens, especially in the first five years um, of fragile sovereignty. The first housing scheme of immigrant um, settlements or agricultural settlements uh, attempted to replicate the kibbutz model and house immigrants in border settlements to stake claims to the state territory and to shape these new citizens as kibbutz pioneers. Um, one of the pivotal cases I was looking at is Moshav Tirat Yehuda, which uh, settled uh, immigrants from Tunisia and Bulgaria on the lands of a former Palestinian uh, plantation. Um, yet the formation of these border settlements did not um, meet the, the pace of immigration. Um, and at the same time, many immigrants were not interested in their assigned role of pioneers or cannon fodder, uh, border defense. Um, and which produced great social unrest. The second housing scheme was the transitory camp, or Mabara, which transferred immigrants from, from the barrack housing to provisional family housing in tents, wooden and tin shacks surrounding existing um, um, settlements um, for employment. This, uh, the pivotal case for these settlements, the Ksalon Mabara, was a lab for a variety of, um, of uh, transitory types. Um, all of these meager housing um, that you can see here, you can see um, tents, tin shacks, wooden shacks, smaller and bigger as kind of a um, experiment in the which of these would be mostly uh, most appropriate. However, um, the precarious nature of these of these housing deteriorated very quickly to substandard conditions, uh, for example, you can see here, which marked the immigrants second class citizens vis-a-vis -vis the veteran citizens who were living in permanent well-serviced housing. The results of social unrest led to a third program in five years, um, the well-known citizen dispersal plan by Ariel Sharon, known as the Ariel Sharon plan, Israel's first master plan. The plan matched the goals of the two initial plans by using the immigrants to stake claims to the periphery of Israeli territory by forming immigrant towns with proper permanent housing. 
This housing were based on the model of the veteran, veteran citizen housing type, uh, exhibited to the public via exhibitions. For example, you can see here exhibitions where citizens were expected to read plans um, as a way for including the citizens in the process of their of their inclusion in the nas national home. This third program fi finally consolidated the Israeli housing regime based on a conception shared by state and citizens, which identified proper citizens with proper housing and proper citizenship. The Israeli Ministry of Housing has invested in a number of elaborate housing estates, many involving experimental architectural design and novel technologies, um, which were important for consolidating Israeli architecture culture and well recognized in international architectural um, professional press and, and uh, journals worldwide. Of course, this um, elaborate program uh, for citizen housing did not apply to Israel's Arab Palestinian population, uh, the population that did not leave and remain to become Israeli citizens. Uh, Mazra, which was my pivotal case for the um, for the plantation, um, is also very important for the formation of the housing strategy by this public um, after 1948. Palestinians who remained to become Israeli citizens were not cared for by the Israeli housing regime, uh, which, as I said, identified proper housing with proper citizenship. Um, Mazra became a site where many internal refugee Palestinians uh, were pushed to after 1948. The um, loosely populated plantation soon became a densely populated landscape of ever intensifying built environment. Now it is one of the most dense Arab Palestinian settlements in Israel. Uh, it exemplifies uh, the um, Palestinian Israeli stra housing strategy of Sumud, which is Arabic for staying put, uh, versus the Palestinian claim for the right of return. Israeli Palestinians claim for Sumud means insisting on staying put in their home village and not living for whatever reason. This means building one's house on top of, behind of, or somehow on the family plot, uh, defying planning procedures and creating a dense, very dense urban clusters. Uh, for example, one of the surf housings that I identified in, in, from 19, uh, uh, 1982, um, has over the years turned into um, um, uh, a house uh, housing 12 uh, families and some 120 people, including three straight staircases that do not converge and an elaborate um, uh, system of use of, of space. Uh, Israeli Palestinian smooth strategy of staying put is therefore dramatically different from Palestinian demand um, for return invoking the United Nations tent. Um, and so while housing um, is, of course, um, designed and constructed across the country uh, um, today, uh, little architecture effort is, is contemporarily invested in this design problem. And architecture, in a sense, no longer holds a seat at the table regarding housing um, as it used to. So um, I have been, uh, in a sense, pointing to a new research question. The question, uh, why has Israeli architecture, which has been consolidated revolving housing, has lost interest in, in, in uh, this design problem? Um, so while this, uh, I'm specifically researching the Israeli homeland enterprise, this research question is highly relevant beyond Israel, um, as many national architecture cultures have lost interest in mass housing uh, by the early 80s. Um, it is therefore both a case study research question and a question revolving architecture, history, and theory of our discipline. Um, so uh, the, the problem with this research question um, is that um, I'm in a sense trying to study uh, something that did not happen. How do we, uh, how do we study uh, something that does, did not happen, right? Uh, the pivotal case method does not help here because uh, the pivotal case is in a sense missing. So I have been grappling with this problem uh, during the 2019-2020 academic year as uh, the co-chair of the um, um, Israel Institute of Advanced Study Research Group, 
re-theorizing the architecture of housing as grounds for research and practice, together with Gaia and Suzanne. Um, and uh, in my research group, the Housing Lab uh, research group. Um, and uh, in, during this year at, at the Institute, uh, brainstorming uh, with 10 international scholars, among them Dana, who is here today, um, our approach was um, the use and interrogation of housing terminology as an entry into uh, the matters that matter in the study of mass housing. So I will use the remains of my time to walk you through my terminological search for the right term via which to conceptualize um, that which was not happening, so the, this lack of architecture from contemporary uh, mass housing. Um, so um, kind of to re reiterate, uh, I, was being, I have been using the term homeland to discuss the history of Israel-Palestine um, as a history of citizen housing. Um, pointing to housing as the key strategy and reason death of Zionism, right? Um, and I, I was identifying three historical periods uh, for that. Um, so pushing forward from that, I was using, uh, I tried the, the, to use the term impact in order to identify the mutual relationship of impact between homeland and modern architecture and the way that modern architecture and, um, and and homeland were molding together. Um, this um, this term I, uh, was presented in the the conference that we were holding um, last November at uh, Technion. Uh, many of you participated, and um, um, so. Um, when we look at this relationship of impact, uh, we can see that starting the early pre-state architecture of um, 1910 and 1920s, we see quite a puzzling phenomenon um, of meager, quite basic housing architecture of basic white cubes, right? Uh, all designed by professional architects uh, with proven expertise in modern design. Um, moreover, the archives expose extensive, long, and even heated debates um, revolving the, the design efforts for these quite basic structures. Um, I mentioned the three iconic examples of the Hebrew city, the kibbutz, and the national master plan. Um, we clearly see from these examples that modern professional architecture was allocated a decisive role around the table in materializing the homeland enterprise. Um, and so, um, so the starting point was a starting point of strong mutual impact, but I was looking, in a sense, uh, for the break in this relationship. So um, uh, for, for a while, architecture culture uh, seemed to be the term that I was looking for. Um, so trying to identify when architects stopped being interested um, in, in housing. However, in, admittedly, my interest does not lie in the architect or in architectural discourse, but rather in the object itself, or in the object around which homeland and the modern profession in Israel shaped one another. And so uh, I gave up architecture culture as a term and, uh, and, and started examining um, the term experiment. In the late 1970s, aiming to meet the well-known challenges of modernist repetitive uh, housing blocks, the Ministry of Housing encouraged architects to explore new forms for mass housing as a sphere of experimentation, uh, with examples like Svi Hecker's remote Polin estate. Um, so I, I examined the term uh, experiment in order to map this exploratory opportunity that housing posed for reshaping the architectural profession as well as human habitats in the in the um, Israeli context of homeland. Um, interestingly, when examining the data uh, and discussing with with my research group members, experiment uh, quickly presented itself as the inaccurate representation of this design of the design processes at hand. Um, as uh, Abigail Sachs has shown in her study of the introduction of scientific methods into architecture. Experiment is essentially a frame of mind by which trial allows for error. Uh, in experimentation, um, 
success and failure are equally acceptable and are often as productive in the process of scientific inquiry. And uh, um, indeed, this uh, uh, housing estate was misunderstood as an experimental and disciplinary introvert uh, project and uh, often read as uh, the pivotal case where architects were willing to accept failure. Um, inspired perhaps by Peter Cook's statement, uh, experiment is inevitable, who was referring to Hecker, um, and a speculative paper architecture. In the, in the Israeli context, this uh, estate is rendered a failure to accommodate the ultra-Orthodox uh, community that is housed there, uh, and kind of presented as the equivalent of the Point Igo uh, estate in St. Louis as the example of mass housing failure by design. So um, you can see uh, in Ramos Kulin the, the slow deterioration of the building by its um, in inhabitants as, as a kind of a, um, a destruction of the building. But this was hardly the case uh, when we look at the facts. Uh, architects V. Hacker participated in the homeland enterprise of annexing East Jerusalem via large housing estates for Israeli citizens beyond the Green Line, so part of the post-1967 uh, homeland enterprise. Um, the project was introduced to the public um, in the planning stage via public exhibitions. This is Tzvi Hecker presenting the project in an, uh, to the uh, ultra-Orthodox and other communities uh, in an exhibition at the Israel Museum. It was inaugurated in, uh, at the presence of state leaders um, and it worked to adapt space packaging and prefabricated uh, construction uh, theory into um, methods for practical construction for mass housing. Um, so in a sense, I'd like to argue that in, Pol in Ramot Polin, Polin um, Tzvi Hecker worked in the tradition of Israeli homeland enterprise throughout its history. Um, it was not experimental since failure was explicitly unacceptable. Um, the, the dire consequences of, of, uh, of failure would mean the failure to produce the national home enterprise uh, and later the failure to accumulate um, and uh, to accumulate future citizens to serve as a collective national home and the failure to expand. So failure was, was not an option uh, for, not, for any of these uh, projects, and therefore uh, they, they were not about experimentation. Uh, however, distinct in terms of uh, ideology from one another, so specifically the, the communist, uh, socialist communist kibbutz uh, differed significantly in ideology from the capitalist uh, Hebrew city and from the statist master plan. Uh, however, um, uh, all of these projects, for all of these projects, um, architects played a decisive role since Zionist society in all its fractions seemed, seemed to take as a given to assume that architecture was relevant and cardinal for the cultural, political and economic project of homeland. So uh, Zionists Zionist have not doubted the significance of architecture as a necessary discipline around the table. Um, perhaps due to the analysis of the, of the Jewish problem as one that lacked physical vessel for Jewish culture and Jewish life. Um, and for this purpose, they needed professional, professional form givers experienced in shaping spaces for new society, namely modernist architects. So the term I'm now um, exploring is the term tavnit, which is Hebrew for shape or mold, and for the instrument that uh, gives shape to materials to materials such as concrete. Um, and uh, inspired by Sandra Pavu's discussion of architecture's seat at the table in post-war France mass housing um, as one of the nodes of, of, the, of the project's polygon, and of course, again, by Turner's etymology of housing, I have reimagined homeland as a polygon mold, kind of a polygon mold, the Tavnit, uh, where architecture serves as one of, uh, one of the sides of this mold. And without this uh, side, the polygon is incomplete and open and, um, in a sense, emptied of meaning and content. Um, and so using terminology uh, has been 
a key methodological tool for me in conceptualizing the nature, uh, the nature of this impactful relationship between modern architecture and the Israel homeland enterprise. And I would like to argue that the persistent housing crisis that we are now witnessing, um, this is why I have this image <laughs> in, uh, underneath, um, involves um, um, involves the the um, changes to the to the Tovnit of homeland, and um, that overcoming this uh, housing crisis um, in Israel and in a sense in the discipline requires the reauthorization of the architecture of mass, mass housing and rearticulation of the design methods for housing in um, the neoliberal contemporary moment. Um, so just kind of a teaser, um, new research in my group um, has, a, has identified some architectural responses that reform Tovnit by rethinking architecture uh, as a key element of the housing process and rethinks design methods for mass housing within the neoliberal uh, housing market um, in Israel. This is our pivotal case, uh, Herzliya Hills, which I was hoping to uh, give you a tour of in the conference. Uh, unfortunately, this won't happen soon. Um, and and compare, comparing it, uh, contextualizing it with other cases um, of, of, uh, of housing um, for middle class mass housing um, elsewhere. And so um, I therefore kind of think about Israel Palestine as a, as a pivotal case in the study of, of mass housing and um, um, kind of consider uh, this study as a, in conversation with a lot of the, of the inquiry that is conducted um, by all the people who participate in this theory, in this um, 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 lecture series and in the middle class mass housing um, group of scholars, as we try to find methodological ways of investigating the role of architecture um, in the history and in the contemporary discipline. Um, thank you.